Welcome to the final lecture in the Theorising Social Life module. This week we're going to look at transhumanism as a phenomenon, which brings us fully into the 21st century and in fact is a bit of a futuristic phenomenon. So although um, transhumanism is already something in existence as an idea, it's in its early stages. So we're going to look at how that develops into the potential future which will include touching on the theories of Donna Haraway a little bit and some um, assignment support for your blog. So if you want to um, ask any questions in the, the uh, Q&A live session or if you can't make it to that you might send them in by email and I'll uh, either respond directly to you by email or I can answer the questions in the live session and record it so you can then listen to the answers later on. So just to recap, you need about 1,500 words worth of blog posts. So depending on how long your blog posts are, of course, that could be two, three, four posts. Um, ones you're happy with out of the selection you've put up on your blog. You are allowed to do a bit of editing for spelling and, and things like that if you want to ch change it a bit from what you initially posted to the version of it you want to cut and paste into your submitted work. And then you add, at the end of it, 500 word reflective piece talking about your learning journey. Now, as we've said in class, what that actually means is any ideas you have had a change of mind on since the first lecture, so that's sociological ideas, things you, you used to think one thing about and now you come to think something differently about um, as a result of going through the lectures, but also, as importantly, resources you have found both useful and not very useful at all. So you could, for example, mention particular books that you found very helpful, or maybe you've listened to podcasted lectures from um, TED or one of the other big YouTube sources that you might have found useful, or indeed useless. Uh, you might have found online journal articles, websites, chatting with other students in class, um, helpful or not helpful, so it's mentioning what's worked for you in terms of improving your grasp of sociology and anything that's proved a bit difficult. And the idea is by the end of it you're saying, uh, for future, for next year, for future reference, I will try to use more of so-and-so source as I have found this very useful during my second year and I will avoid using such and such a source because I did not find that particularly useful this year so I shan't be bothering to use it next year. Because it's a reflective piece, you can use the word I. Um, you might want to include a little bit of theory from you know, um, teaching theory. People who've, who've spoken about the best way to learn things is by doing this, by doing that. So you can include a bit of support from academic sources in that, but chiefly you're thinking about your own experiences. Okay, so moving on to transhumanism and what it is. The word was coined by Julian Huxley back in the 50s. He was a eugenicist and biologist. Um, eugenicists uh, also gained rather a, a sort of a dirty name for itself as a result of the Nazis, although it wasn't doing particularly well even before the Nazis. It's a school of thought in which um, the genetic quality of humanity is improved by things like planned breeding, um, genetic manipulation, trying to, rather than just relying on nature and good luck to improve genetic situations, it's using science and social policy to improve the human genetic pattern, which has led to things in the past like um, deliberate breeding camps, extermination, death camps, things like that as a way of trying to manipulate the human genetic code um, with, well, shall we say, rather limited success. Uh, transhumanists are humanists in the philosophical sense, not in the psychological sense, by which I mean this doesn't have any particular relevance to psychologists um, like Carl Rogers and Abraham Maslow, the, the exponents of humanistic psychology. Rather, this is more the philosophical area of humanism as expanded by people like Brian Cox and Richard Dawkins, in which they reject religion as superstition without any foundation or basis in reality, and instead favour humanity 
relying entirely upon itself to improve its own situation, solve its own problems, primarily through the use of science and rationalism, reason. So it's part of that tradition. But chiefly what it's trying to argue is that the particular forms of science which can most help humanity now in the 21st century are technological fusions and genetic research into altering, amending and augmenting the human body. Now per se this is nothing completely not, not new. Um, people have been looking at heart transplants, organ, other organ transplants, artificial limbs, or various varieties for, well, the, the transplant surgery is newish, 20th century, but the uh, use of artificial limbs goes back a long way. They've just got more technologically sophisticated from pirates with wooden legs through to the kind of high-tech style of artificial limb you get these days. So that's nothing completely new. Where we m move into a different remit is that medical ethics have traditionally been about repairing the body. So somebody loses a leg and they get given an artificial leg. Somebody um, starts to suffer poor eyesight and they get a pair of glasses or laser eye surgery or whatever it might be to try and improve the functioning of their body and restore it back to full functioning or at least as close as possible. Transhumanism moves away from that and into augmenting the body. What augmentation means is enabling humans to do things which their body never could do in the first place. So rather than repairing a damaged body, it's about taking a, a healthy body and giving it abilities that are brand new. By embedding um, technology in the human body, by altering the genetic code, by engaging in other forms of cutting-edge research and experimentation to try and change what the human body is capable of. So we're sliding a little bit into high science fiction um, realms now, uh, the, the kind of area that you know, Cybermen on Doctor Who and all that sort of thing conjures up those rather grim images of people who are more machine than organic bodies. Quite how far transhumanism will go is unlimited, and that is in itself a feature of the transhumanist movement, that they don't believe limitations are either necessary or desirable. That it should be a kind of an, an open end. You change and change as much as you, as an individual, want to change without any interference from the state. Um, religion would be dispensed with, so you wouldn't have to worry about interference from bishops and imams and rabbis and so on. Um, the only limits on transhumanist research would be the limits of science itself, how far scientific knowledge has progressed at any given point in time, and if we're being practical, limitations of money, because obviously none of this is free, it all has to be paid for. So the declaration you can see on the screen was put out a few years ago, the Transhumanist Declaration provided by the World Transhumanist Association. Humanity will be radically changed by technology in the future. We foresee the feasibility of redesigning the human condition, including such parameters as the inevitability of aging, limitations on human and artificial intellects, unchosen psychology, suffering, and our confinement to the planet Earth. And so if we break that down a little bit, because it does sound all very Star Trek, Doctor Who type stuff at the moment. Um, in terms of redesigning the human condition, this means, again, investing money, time, scientific knowledge into looking at ways to get the human body to do things it never could do in the first place. It's so expanding beyond artificial limbs and all that sort of stuff into a total redesign of the body. So the inevitability of aging. Now, obviously, as we all know, um, we get old, we get wrinkly, we get saggy, bits go south, our hair goes grey or falls out, all the rest of it, eyesight, hearing, things become not as good as they used to be when you were younger. And for hundreds upon thousands of years, we have accepted that as human beings, and obviously we see exactly the same thing happening to cats and dogs and horses and sheep and whatnot as they age and, and also experience the impacts of aging. 
So it's been the condition of organic being since the very first amoeba. Is that something we're going to have to continue living with for the next million years? Or should we invest scientific know-how, expertise and all of the money that was required to fund it into finding ways to either slow down the aging process or stop it entirely? So that, for example, you could go on having the body of a 30-year-old even when you're 80, 90, 150, whatever age you might get to. If ageing could be slowed down or completely stopped, does death then become inevitable? In other words, if your body could maintain its fitness that you have when you're 25 or 30, would you just go on and on and on and on living until such time as maybe an accident or an incurable illness did away with you? At the moment, now we live we, when we're living in, in ordinary times, Obviously, it's not just illness and accident that polish people off. Old age polishes people off. So we'll, we'll get to a, a point in our life when we just stop living. Our body just gives up. And that's largely because of the effects of ageing. If we didn't age, would you get to 200, 300, 400, potentially still as fit and healthy as you were when you were 25? If that's the case, it obviously has massive impacts on things like global populations, employment, pensions, all sorts of ideas. If you could go on and on and on living and living and living until such time as, as something happens to polish you off, that would radically change our experience of life on this planet. The limitations on human and artificial intellect are looking at ways of fusing the human brain with technology. So obviously at the moment we can sit and go online and look up websites and read online books and research and all sorts of things from all over the world so long as we have access to the internet through a, a laptop or a, um, an iPod, iPad or one of those other irritating devices. Imagine you had a device plugged into the back of your head where all you had to do was sit and concentrate and it would turn on and you wouldn't need to look at a screen, you wouldn't need to have some device in your hand, you would just sit down somewhere and your brain would rattle onto the internet or whatever the futuristic version of the internet ends up being called and you can see whatever it is that you want to see. You can look up any number of books, you can look up any amount of scientific research, um, and anything that floats your boat, and probably the vast majority of people would end up either looking at cats or pornography. But in this um, super scientific world, there is a slightly, one might say, naive assumption that we would use such easy access to the internet to improve our intellects rather than just to indulge our lusts or our, our sentimentalism for puppies and kittens and what have you. Unchosen psychology refers to mental illness primarily. Um, people suffering from depression, schizophrenia, all sorts of mental health problems that they are unchosen in as much as they didn't want it in the first place. And if they could wave a magic wand and get rid of it, they would do so. Well, the, the aim here is to see if science can provide the proverbial magic wand. Could you remove unwanted psychological states from individuals? And likewise with suffering, so not only move, removing mental suffering, but removing bodily suffering. Aches and pains and coughs and colds and diseases and so forth. Can, which science has been doing for a long time, they're striving to overcome the illnesses and diseases of the body, as well as of the mind. But perhaps in the future, as the body is, or at least this is the hope of transhumanists, as the body is fused with high-tech devices, then the ability to overcome both the aches and pains of the body and the miseries of the mind will be addressed and overcome. Now, where unchosen psychology ends as a concept is a bit nebulous. Some people mainly talk in terms of mental illnesses, but others are saying, can sadness, can loneliness, can the ordinary, everyday human unhappinesses also be overcome by use of technology? So would you ever need to be lonely again if you could patch into a vast neural network 
through a device implanted in your head and share your thoughts with other people and hear their thoughts in exchange? Or would that lead to an entirely new form of insanity? Given what some people's thoughts are like, quite possibly. Um, the last element there about confinement to planet Earth is the notion that one day we will have colonies on the Moon, on Mars, on, on wherever, other planets. And at the moment, obviously, it's, um, we are aware that the human body isn't suited to survive on a lot of planets, lack of oxygen, um, very high or very, very low gravity and so forth, makes survival on those planets remarkably hard with our bodies the way they are now. But transhumanism is about altering the human body. So could you engineer someone's body so that they could breathe the atmosphere on an alien planet rather than breathing Earth-based oxygen atmosphere? Or where their body could survive on a high density or a very low density gravity planet, which had a very different different degree of gravity to the Earth. So it if we go to live on other planets, it won't necessarily be people looking the way we do now. So obviously you, you watch TV shows set in the future and naturally enough it's human actors playing very human looking characters in the 25th or the 30th century. Whereas the transhumanist vision is that by the 25th or the 30th century, humans might look radically different than they do now because our bodies will be at least partially machine based may be entirely machine-based. Zoltan Isfan is a Russian billionaire, an enormously rich man who is a, an ardent advocate of transhumanism. Indeed, some of the most passionate advocates of transhumanism are billionaires, which opens up a few issues in and of itself. Uh, Istvan is of the opinion that transhumanism will become completely mainstream. At the moment, 2020, it's a bit of a minority view, a little bit cranky, a little bit weird. But he is of the view that give it 20, 30 years and loads and loads of people will believe in transhumanism and want to move towards a transhumanist future. Um, and perhaps 30 years from now, the technology will allow them to do more than simply believe in it it will allow them to have some kinds of augmentation done to their bodies. There's already certain things you can get done now, but perhaps in 30 years' time they'll be even more pronounced, even more um, sophisticated forms of technological or genetic intervention in the human body. Um, part of that mainstreaming movement will open up questions of agency and free choice. So at the moment, it's, it's mainly an issue of choice. Do you want to have this done to your body? But maybe 30 years from now, that will begin to alter. There may be certain jobs which are almost impossible to do unless you have had certain alterations done to your body. Or if you want to go on working for that company, it will be made clear to you that you've, you either adapt or you find somewhere else to work. And there may be, in terms of genetic splicing and so forth, um, situations where parents are making decisions about their unborn children, which will not involve giving those unborn children any choice in the matter. They may decide, as, as is already actually possible, but will likely be even more sophisticated 30 years from now, that they want um, a child with a very specific hair colour or they, they definitely want a boy, or they definitely want a girl, or they want a, a child who's very tall, or very athletic, or very clever, or very musical, or whatever, and they will have the, the genes of the, new, of the fetus, newly conceived fetus, altered, so that when the child is born, they are a designer baby, they're born with certain features. Um, whilst that's likely to still be within the range of human possibilities, Eventually, genetic science might, and all of this is quite speculative, but it might allow the introduction of augmented features. So a child who can run faster than any human being has ever run in human history because their body has been adapted in some way. Or a child will be taller than any human being ever has been, for example. There's various ways in which this could progress into the future and become a mainstream choice for any parent with the money to pay for the um, genetic interventions to be carried out. 
According to Istvan, there are three laws of transhumanism, at least as he sees it. Whether this will be stuck to in the future, who knows. And it's inspired partly by Isaac Asimov's Three Laws of Robotics, which he featured in um, a set of, of novels, science fiction novels. So the three laws are that a transhumanist must safeguard their own existence above all else. So if, if um, Mr. Istvan, in 10 years' time, has various cybernetic augmentations made and so on, becomes a fully fledged transhumanist, then his chief loyalty will be to himself and his own continued existence above the existence of anybody else. So if, if there's ever a choice between his life versus somebody else's life, then this law suggests you look out for number one. Um, second law, transhumanists must strive to achieve omnipotence as expediently as possible, so long as one's actions do not conflict with the first law. So omnipotence is to be godlike. So the transhumanists must strive to be godlike. So this is what Mr. Stein would like to attain at some point in the future using technology, genetic augmentation, etc., to try to attain it for himself and by extension for anybody else who wants to become part of the transhumanist movement. Um, so long as the pursuit of omnipotence, of being godlike and all-powerful, does not result in, in death. Because obviously there might be some experiments which are meant to achieve extended power, which actually just kill you off entirely. So you'd have to be cautious to make sure that whatever cutting-edge research you allowed to be done to your body would not actually polish you off, but would extend your power to greater and greater and greater levels. As if being a billionaire already isn't sufficient power. But there we are. Um, and finally, the third rule, a transhumanist must safeguard value in the universe so long as one's actions do not conflict with the first and second laws. So the, the universe is a place of value and interest and, and other beings are of value that should be encouraged and promoted so long as their existence doesn't conflict with your existence or their existence doesn't limit your capacity to achieve omnipotence and extreme power. I could say a few things here, but probably it would result in a court case, so I better not. Um, the YouTube link you've got there is a talk with Zoltan Istvan. Um, so I, I won't play it now because it doesn't play as um, properly in these pre-records. But you can listen to that at your own leisure when you get the chance. And that's him in the little insect photograph there with a quote. Transhumanism is an international social movement that is trying to use science and technology to radically improve and radically modify the human being and the human experience. But, more importantly, Latin-wise, transhuman means beyond human. So most transhumanists are just trying to use technology to leave behind whatever it means to be human. Um, there's a parallel movement called post-humanism which takes a slightly different twist on that and doesn't seek necessarily to leave behind whatever it means to be human way he's saying that so um, at one point it's improving humanity and then it's modifying humanity so being able to do things that humans could never do before and for some people at least not necessarily for all transhumanists but for some it's about ceasing to be human entirely becoming something bigger, better, grander, um, maybe a, a cyborg, a sort of robot-human fusion, maybe evolving into something entirely different, as far removed from what we are today as we are removed from Neanderthal humans a couple hundred thousand years ago, or um, from the, the Anthropocene, or, well, that's a, um, that's wrong, not Austria, Australopithecus, which is even further back in human history and even more ape-like. So could we one day become the equivalent of the Australopithecus, something dimly remembered and looked at in museums as whatever the dominant species on the planet by that stage calls itself, things that used to be human once upon a time but have become something way beyond human? Possibly. Possibly. Lady in the photo there is Donna Haraway, who is an American feminist and academic 
who talks about transhumanism and science and the relationship between science and gender. And there's a whole kind of ongoing discussion of her ideas on that score, some of which you can listen to in the YouTube link there when you get the time. Part of her argument about the fusion between science and feminism, which is not something that desperately interests most transhumanists, because obviously feminism is to do with the female body, the human body, and the whole point of transhumanism is getting beyond such human limits as gender in the first place. But, for her part, Donna Haraway uh, makes the argument that historically, over the centuries, the majority of scientists were men, and they were conducting their research, um, writing in terms, ideas, concepts that were naturally enough the product of male minds because they were men and they were thinking from a very male point of view. Whereas she would like to introduce a more female point of view to balance out the predominance of the male point of view and then at some point in the future we'll have such a mixture of male and female points of view as to achieve a more kind of neutral balanced um, view of science that blends masculine and feminine ideas and language and terms together. So part of her manifesto is how to move science to a more um, balanced approach that incorporates women's experiences and ideas and, and views as much as male ideas. Not all scientists by any stretch of the imagination agree with Donna Haraway. A lot reject the idea that science is masculine and say so simply because historically it's been mostly men doesn't mean it operates from a male point of view that science rather is neutral. It's, it's um, the search for truth and truth is, is neutral. Truth is neither male nor female. It's, it's simply scientific truth. So not everyone embraces her ideas, but some people do. Um, so that manifesto she put out in 1985 and it fuses socialist ideas with feminist ideas. Um, partly she saw the um, scientific community of early 1980s America, she's American, as being quite conservative, quite old-fashioned, quite resistant to feminist ideas. Uh, whether it still is in 2020 is uh, an ongoing debate. Um, some people undoubtedly, I'm sure, will say yes, and other people will say no, the, the scientific community is um, freed of gender biases, or at least severely reduced gender biases, and is much more open to discussion and ideas and concepts in a neutral fashion that, that apply as much to women as they do to men and, and to people of any other gender identity as well. Um, the term she uses there, informatics of domination, is a typical sociological bit of jargon. Uh, the idea of using language, the language of science, of um, informing people, of understanding a subject, from a very masculine point of view and a point of view very much geared to dominating the world, achieving imperialist goals, conquering nature, all of that sort of what she sees as rather masculinized language and terminology. Um, and again, being a socialist, this is a bit of a reaction to what she sees as capitalist imperialism. When she goes on to talk about um, what unites women, that quote there, there is nothing about being a female that naturally binds women together into a unified category. And you could equally say nothing that naturally binds men together into a unified category as well and extend the argument in both directions. She's saying that biology in and of itself is not enough to bind women together to each other. Rather, what they need to bind together over are um, affinities, common experiences, what it's like to be treated in certain societies should bind people together more than simply having a particular set of genitals or a particular set of internal organs. But there's got to be more to um, feminism of binding women together than just biology, um, which has also been partly um, integrated into fourth wave feminism with the idea of um, trans women and transgender identity being a valid form of female expression which is unconnected to again purely biological matters so so you in other words you get some transgendered women who have had surgery and, and 
head alterations and breast implants and, and vaginal surgery and so on. And you get others who haven't had any of that, so they still have their male genitals, but who identify as women. And so this, this kind of sense of bonding together over affinities rather than over biology would therefore enable someone who still has their male genitals to bond together with other women and so we have shared affinities even if we don't have shared biology. So it's um, something that's become more accepted within fourth wave of feminism, whereas second wave feminism is still very much about the biological and the essentialist approach. And that's something that um, Haraway was a bit distancing herself from with this sense of, of moving away from uh, the, the purely biological to the more social. Uh, her, her vision is also quite influenced by standpoint theory and the idea that if you, if science and, and for that matter other kinds of academic subjects like history for example have lots of opinions from different types of people, men and women, um, young and old, rich and poor, black and white and Asian and, and so forth, then all of those different voices come together to create a much more holistic understanding of the subject rather than if all of the academics in a given area are one specific type of person. Uh, this quote from her scientific practice is above all a storytelling practice. Biology is inherently historical and its form of discourse is inherently narrative. Biology as a way of knowing the world is kin to romantic literature with its discourse about organic form and function. Biology is the fiction appropriate to objects called organisms. Biology fashions the facts discovered about organic beings. Um, as a quote, it's the sort of thing that most biologists fall about laughing when they hear uh, and think is absolutely ridiculous. But as a sociologist, she's not a biologist, she's a sociologist, um, she takes this approach that biology is not a hard science but rather it's a form of storytelling, a form of fiction. And so again, it it's fits in with this sort of understanding of third, uh, sorry, fourth wave feminism and its understanding of gender and the relationship between gender and biology. That's, uh, and by extension, not only biology, you could start potentially applying this to other sciences and seeing them as ways of understanding the world and promoting particular values, particular agendas which have an element of arbitrary choice about them, reflect power structures, reflect social institutions, rather than being an objective clinical scientific search for identifiable truths. Very, very postmodernist. Whether you agree with it or not probably depends on whether you're a biologist or a sociologist. <laughs> Those who embrace the hard sciences tend to see this kind of approach as idiotic, whereas those who are much more immersed in certain forms of social science and um, certain forms of politics are much more enthusiastic about embracing these ideas around quite what science is and how we understand science and how objective science actually is. Now, putting um, Haraway to one side for the moment at any rate, going back to transhumanism more fundamentally, transhumanism is built on a philosophical bedrock called meliorism, which we have mentioned in previous classes, but as a reminder, meliorism is the idea that the world is gradually getting better with every decade that passes. Better and better and better. Science progresses, gets more sophisticated, medicine improves, um, social freedoms get better, and so being a um, well, being a woman in 2020 is better than being a woman in 1720 or 1520 or 1320, and equally for that matter, being a man is better in 2020 than it was 500 years ago or a thousand years ago. Particularly if you are uh, an average citizen rather than a super duper rich one. Um, because the lot of the, the working class man has vastly improved over the last thousand years. Um, the lot of the extremely rich, well, health wise, medicine wise, has greatly improved. 
Um, in some of them respects, it's perhaps quite similar to the way it was a thousand years ago. Um, but that quote there from Stephen Goldman about the backbone of the doctrine of progress is that something is better than it had been and promises to get better still in the future is the bedrock of meliorism. You pick a scientific subject and you say, today, 2020, it is better than it was 50 years ago, 100 years ago, 500 years ago, and equally, more importantly perhaps, it will get better in the future. So this scientific topic in 50 years time, in 100 years time, in 500 years time, will be way, way ahead of where it is today. It assumes the future is always going on an upward trajectory. Now there are points in history where things have gone backwards, but um, often that is a temporary setback and, and then they get on track to greater improvements in terms of academics and scientific subjects, in terms of civil liberties for the individual, in terms of material standards of living and so on, gradually getting better and better. There's a shift from Darwinian evolution, which is leaving it to nature, for different species, to you know, ourselves included, to adapt to a changing environment, to an increasing designer evolution, in which humanity takes charge of its own evolution. Now we've been taking charge to some extent of evolution for other species for quite a while, deliberately breeding certain characteristics into dogs, into sheep, into cows, into horses, and so on. We've been doing that for a long, long time now. And, and likewise with a lot of plant species, we've been deliberately engineering and, and fiddling with the genetics of different species for quite some time. So the transhumanists see the next natural step in that scientific discipline being to expand from only fiddling with the genetics of dogs and horses and, and sheep and what have you to doing the same for ourselves, to applying the same kind of scientific procedures and practices and intentions to the human race itself where we choose how to evolve, how to change our bodies, how to change our minds using technology, genetic science, and whatever other techniques come along in the 500 years time. So once upon a time, they would argue we were slaves to our own genetics, but in the future, we will become fully self-conscious and choosing to adapt genetics to ourselves. So I want to, you know, or, well, not me personally, but somebody will say to themselves, oh, I'm, I don't want to be blonde today, I want to be ginger. Why wouldn't they say that? Everyone should say that. And then they will go and have their genes spliced and amended, and instead of dyeing their hair, they will genetically alter the fundamental structure of their hair to the colour they want it. Or they will use scientific augmentation to make themselves taller or shorter, fatter or thinner, expand their memories, develop talents they never had in the first place. All down to their own choice. All of this, of course, does ignore the economics of the situation because choice is limited by what you can afford in the first place. And whilst very few transhumanists ever talk about price tags, the fact that some of the leading lights in the movement are billionaires is probably the reason why they don't talk about price tags because they don't have to think about those sorts of things themselves. But for the average person, if any of this technology is realised, then it will come with a price tag. And the question will be, become who can afford it? Not simply who wants it. Um, Harari's ideas on religion we have touched on quite a few times in the past. Um, for him, science and religion are not enemies as they have been portrayed during the 19th, late 19th and into the 20th century. He says rather that they are natural allies and will again at some point come back together as natural allies. Um, science interested in power, the power to control the world and ourselves. Religion interested in promoting social harmony and order. And so together the wish to promote social order and the wish to have power and control over life will dovetail into one another. And he sees, what well, we touched on this a little bit in previous lectures, he sees the religions of the late 21st century into the 22nd, 23rd and so on centuries as fusing scientific development 
with more abstract intellectual, philosophical, religious ideals to shape the way the world would be then and the way humanity would be then. Um, he touches a little bit on the Catholic idea of original sin, um, which, which is the doctrine that people are born sinful and must strive to get better, to say there is a, a sort of um, transhumanist version of this in which people are born genetically flawed rather than sinful. F genetically flawed but can get better, except as far as the transhumanist is concerned that the betterment is mainly through the application of science and biological research and technology than it is through prayer, meditation, reading the Bible and all of that. Uh, a quote there from Langdon Gilkey, which is quite a name to conjure with, Morals do not advance in history. Hence, a progress of technology may in fact augur a regress in social harmony and social justice. Instead of saving mankind, can threaten to become the demonic instrument of mankind's destruction. So Gilkey is not quite as enthused by these processes as other people are and suggests that moral development in the 21st century is not so very different from the morals we had in the 15th century or the 5th century or, or the 1st century. That part of human capacity doesn't change a lot. The technology may change, but we don't. And so just as you've had tyrants and monsters and awful people a thousand years ago, so you'll still have tyrants and monsters and awful people today who will seek to exploit the power over their own bodies, the power over other people's bodies. And just as once upon a time you had um, the wealthy and the powerful using their advanced technology to enslave other people and force them to work on their farms and down their mines and in their factories. So whatever the latest scientific developments are of the year, 2055 there'll be people abusing those developments for their own advantage to do horrible things to other people perhaps on a very very grand scale so rather than necessarily as Harari argues making the world a more harmonious and orderly place it might be the case that some people get to use all these scientific advancements to make the world a really dreadful place and will actually go back so instead of getting more liberated, more freedom, we'll see less freedom, more tyranny. We won't know till we get there, but it's kind of flagged up as a concern. Uh, chap in the photograph there is Ray Kurtzfield, um, who um, was one of the early voices arguing that the singularity is near. Um, the singularity is the, the, this sort of slightly mythical moment at some point in the future of complete fusion between humanity in our case and the machine where we become as one we become a singular entity and we attain a degree of immortality and immense power by fusing ourselves with um, artificial intelligence with cybernetic systems and that quote from Kurzweil, uploading a human brain means scanning all of its salient details and then reinstantiating those details into a suitable, powerful computational substrate. This process would capture a person's entire personality, memory, skills and history. Putting that in plain English terms, it's a way of scanning, or well, the hope is, and it can't be done at the moment, but one day there will be a way of scanning the human mind, taking out all the salient details from it, converting it into computer algorithms, and then programming that into some incredibly sophisticated machine. And so in effect you would transfer a person from their body, their, their old-fashioned biological body, into a robot body. And that robot would have their memories, their skills, their personality. So it would be like shifting one of your relatives out of their human body and into a, a mechanical body, into a robot body, or an android body, or whatever term you want to use. 
the highlighting of the word salient and bold typeface is my choice rather than Kurtzfeld's because I think that's worth noting. Effectively saying that whoever's doing the scanning, the, the, the scientists in question, evaluating this person, taking the salient points from them and putting it into a robot, begs the question of what is salient and equally what's irrelevant. What's important about a person to upload to a robot? What's irrelevant about a person to upload to a robot? Because clearly there's going to be some things that serve very little purpose to a machine. So I'm sitting here eating my own body weight in the fudge because I like it. If, I, if my brain was somehow transferred into a robot that never needs to eat, what would be the purpose of transferring my, my tastes and my appetites and the things I like to eat or the things I like to drink if my new body is not, has no need to eat, no need to drink? What would be the point of trying to make it able to do that? If the new robot body well, presumably won't need to reproduce or breed, so would there be any need to transfer someone's sexual preferences? Whether we're talking in terms of them being gay, straight, bisexual, or whether they prefer blondes or brunettes or short people or tall people or whatever their predilections are, would there be any need to transfer any of that into a robot body, which will not breed? Has no need to reproduce or engage in sex at all. Uh, and then we get into these weird debates about what is salient of the human experience that's worth preserving which begs the very question of what is human in the first place. At the moment, we're lucky enough not to have these kinds of discussions in the sense that this is all fantasy of the future. It's fiction. It cannot be done at the moment, so it's all theoretical and hot air. But at some point, this might become a very real discussion as to what actually makes a human human. So if you're going to deposit that humanity into an artificial body, what parts of it are you going to transfer across? And what parts have become irrelevant and, and not worth bothering transferring across? It's, it's very complex as a subject. It opens up a world of, of quite grim issues in many ways. The aspirational side of transhumanism is looking at what can be made better in this futuristic version of ourselves whether we have completely artificial robot bodies or whether we are a fusion, a sort of a, a part human, part robot, cyborg or whatever we might end up as. The curing of disabilities. So in the future you'd no longer have blind people or deaf people or at least amongst those who could afford the treatments and wanted the treatments. You wouldn't have blind people, deaf people, paralysed people and so on, because all of that would be alterable. Which then opens up questions of, of um, willingness. So will we, partly, will people be obliged to have these treatments, whether they want them or not? Uh, maybe that could be a condition of health care and future employment and so on, that someone has got to take a given treatment, got to have their body augmented, changed, amended in some way. It also opens up a question of social class in which if in the future um, these things are um, costed, they, they come at a price, will only the super rich be able to afford to have these things treated? Will it be available to those with less money? Will it be part of a private health insurance scheme in countries like America that have it? Will it be part of the national health scheme in countries such as ourselves, where we have state-run health care? Or will it be something you have to pay for? And therefore you'll have the very rich with all of the latest amendments to their bodies. And then you'll have everybody else who can't afford those amendments. And effectively, two very different classes of people. So health issues can be addressed. Longevity can be addressed because potentially if the body can keep being patched up, patched up and patched up, um, either through um, scientific adaptations, 
computerized body parts or through genetic interventions, then you can have somebody who lives to be 150, 200, 300, and perhaps is quite fit and young looking for most of that period of time. Again, will that be for everyone or will that just be for a social elite? These aren't issues often touched on by transhumanists who are too impassioned to talk about the, the, the gains to think about the more practical applications of how this is going to work. And, and also it opens up questions of population growth if you've got suddenly people stop dying off in significant numbers and keep on and on and on living. What will that do to the structure of society? What about issues such as retirement? And when people are allowed to, to leave work and so forth? If intelligence can be augmented, education can be augmented, would you need to say you want to learn to, to speak Dutch? Would you be able to just go along to a centre, pay a sum of money, they plug you into a machine for 10 minutes and the entire Dutch language is uploaded into your brain, job done. And likewise, any subject under the sun, you wouldn't need to go to school, you'd just spend 10 minutes in a building somewhere, or, or even at home maybe, having the knowledge of a given subject uploaded to your brain. Would that be a fantastic world to live in, or would that be a bizarre world in which some people would be able to afford immense amounts of knowledge, and other people would have to learn the old-fashioned way, or just not learn at all? do away with the need for teachers which then begs the question of what we're going to do when we're all in the dog here um, emotional control would we be able to induce calmness and, and a kind of a sedate approach to life that tackles anger that tackles despair but also could that be used in a, a sinister way for a government to stop its citizens ever getting angry and protesting against its excesses to keep its citizens constantly calm and sedated through medication, through some other form of scientific manipulation, perhaps. Notions of art, of spirituality, um, of what is best for our children, our grandchildren and so on, would all be addressed and discussed and explored in this brave new world. It does open up a realm of biopolitics, coming back to ideas from Michel Foucault. And we could equally argue maybe some of this would be necropolitics if we want to go into the realms of Achille Mbembe. Um, so that the right to life becomes an issue. Uh, if the goal is only to have the most augmented and perfect and advanced fetuses born into the world, does that mean an awful lot more abortions would be taking place? How would we then understand other species if they too could be experimented upon and augmented? So might you one day um, go all a bit Planet of the Apes and have chimpanzees that can learn to speak English or French or Spanish um, because of the augmentations made to their brain, then having the right to vote, having all sorts of other citizenship rights. Um, a chimera is... a uh, a spliced creature where the genetics of two or three or four creatures are mixed together to create something that's never existed previously in the history of the planet. Um, those creatures could be developed for use in medical research, they could be used, developed for use in warfare, for as weird pets, high-end expensive pets. They could be used in all sorts of ways, potentially augmented to the point where they too have their own intellectual capacities and it then begs the question of what rights should or should they not have. Uh, control of reproduction may become a factor. Obviously we're at this point in history anyone within reason can have a child so long as they can find someone who wants to have a child with them. Um, if the goal is to create this super duper species of, of perfected humans would there be a governmental desire to limit who can reproduce and make sure that the genetically inferior don't reproduce and only the genetically superior do? Would that become a phenomenon? Possibly it would. And again, what would happen to anyone who didn't fit in that pattern, that expectation? There's all sorts of routes by which that could become a factor and we may see 
a world in which cloning becomes more standard so that you could have 30 versions of Einstein or equally you could have 30 versions of Rupert Murdoch in the world who are genetically identical to the original version and would grow up and, and well, who knows what they would go on to do in the future. Um, this can be understood in, both in terms of bringing great benefits to the world but also because again it's going to be likely a privilege of the very well off to have these services it might bring really quite gruesome things into the world potentially and require all sorts of rather unusual rules and regulations to, to um, control what does and doesn't happen. The fixing of disabilities we've already discussed to some extent uh, uh, all sorts of things might be possible um, does that make them desirable? Should there be rules and regulations as to what could be done or should as transhumanists hope it be a complete free-for-all. So there are already people who have quite extreme cosmetic procedures, have horns implanted into their heads, have their tongues split in half like a snake's tongue, um, have all sorts of weird surgical procedures done to them. Potentially the sky could be the limit on that one as to how far it can be taken, how far it can be developed. Should we be able to have anything we want and can afford to pay for done to us? Should it be on the NHS? So even if you can't afford to have it done, you could perhaps be able to access all kinds of biological modifications done to your body for purely cosmetic reasons, rather than for reasons of medical necessity. On and on and on it goes. Um, the use of medication in the water or possibly pumped into the air supply to regulate the mood um, is something that's been argued in favour by various people over the years and possibly if you believe half the paranoid conspiracy theorists that do the rounds maybe is even being experimented with in some parts of the world as we speak. Will it become more mainstream, more than norm? Or will we see other forms of um, mind control developing? particularly if larger and larger numbers of people can plug their minds directly into something like the internet or whatever version of the internet exists in 50 years time would it be possible to hack directly into another human being's mind and make them think things you want them to think or stop them from thinking things you don't want them to think maybe an area that becomes focused upon the quote there on the left hand side from Marcy Donosky uh, challenges the idea of what women would like from genetics. If they would like it at all, in fact. It will take focused effort to make it clear that altering the genes of one's children is not amongst the reproductive rights for which so many women and women's organisations have struggled. So the right to have children or not have them in the first place is something which women have been struggling for scientifically, socially and so on for a very long time now. The, the right to control your own reproductive processes has been the key focus of the feminist movement and the, the proto-feminist movements. The right to decide whether or not you want a, a son or a daughter, whether or not you want a six foot tall or a five foot tall child, through genetic manipulation, Darnowski is arguing it is outside the remit of feminism, is not to be sold to feminists as something that they should be grateful for and happy for. She's got a, a, a somewhat more jaded view of that, shall we say, uh, and sees this as being pitched to women as a game when in fact it's not, and women should be focusing on other issues. And clearly it does open up some very, and we know from history that eugenics often leads in some very dark directions. There are apologists for eugenics who say it doesn't have to lead in those dark directions, it can go in a more positive route. But it's a, shall we say, the positive route is a narrow path, easily strayed from, if history is anything to go by. On, on the other side you've got people like James Hughes, who um, is quite in favour of 
the idea of um, animal genetic splicing and sees opposition to it as um, kind of resistance to scientific development and scientific advancement uh, and feels that this is an area we need a lot of lot more discussion and a lot more understanding of. So there's already research that's gone on and been done uh, with food products of mixing genes from one plant with another plant or one animal with another animal um, or sometimes even across the plant animal divide to try and create food products that last longer or stay fresher or taste slightly differently or can do things that previously they haven't been able to do. At the moment there's been a lot of resistance to the idea of splicing human beings with genetic codes from other animals or indeed putting human genes into other animals. Is this something that will become more mainstream in 50 years time? And are you still human? If you're a human being that's got a genetic code from a um, a dog or a donkey or an eagle or something, are you still fully human? And in, equally so, if you've got a pig that's got elements of genetic, human genetic um, code in it, is it still a pig or has it become something else that must be treated differently? None of this is clear cut, it's also open for debate and discussion. Uh, the quote here from George Annas looks at the potential conflict we've already mentioned very briefly earlier that might come about in a future society. The post-human will come to see us, the garden variety human, as inferior subspecies, without human rights to be enslaved or slaughtered preemptively. It is this potential for genocide based on genetic difference that I have termed genetic genocide that makes species altering genetic engineering a potential weapon of mass destruction. So his argument there is that at some point in the future, let's say, in the year 2080 for argument's sake, you might have one group of people who are human beings with enormous amounts of genetic and technological modifications, and then you've got another group of people who are born the ordinary way and don't have any genetic or technological enhancements to them, they're just bog-standard humans. Will the, the super-advanced humans look down their noses at bog standard humans and consider them scum of the earth kind of on a par with cavemen or something and either treat them like dirt and keep them as slave labor or maybe even just get rid of them entirely but a lot of science fiction films that have this idea of super clever robots deciding to wipe out humanity as, irre as irrelevant well Annas is here arguing that you'll have super developed humans that see ordinary humans as, as pointless and will want to get rid of them. That could just be a bit of sci-fi doom and gloom, or it might turn out to be quite a realistic understanding of the human capacity for bigotry, snobbery, hostility to the different. Only time will tell. Uh, chap in the photograph there is Neil Harbison. And that weird thing that's over his head isn't some kind of peculiar hat. It's actually implanted directly into his skull and his brain. Uh, he is an artist who is colourblind. And that weird device enables him to experience colour. He had it implanted into his brain quite willingly. And he, I don't know, I don't actually know if he can unscrew it or if it's in there permanently. Um, but he says he, he normally walks around with it in and on many an occasion he's had people shouting abuse at him or punching him and, and doing various things. Um, whether that's purely because of the device or for other reasons, I would not like to speculate. But he does say he gets a bit of, of negative stick. He regards himself as a transhuman and says that give it a few more decades and loads of people will have devices implanted into them that enable them to do things they cannot currently do. It would become mainstreamed. So he sees himself as sort of ahead of the crowd, if you like, in terms of getting these um, applications and devices. Uh, Emily Whitaker puts forward the suggestion that um, economically there'd be a great advantage in having a cybernetic population, people with you know, computer implants and so on, 
in that it would be a way of overcoming disease and the problems of old age. And so you would need very little in terms of hospitals and healthcare. You probably wouldn't need to give people pensions and you probably wouldn't need to um, have retirement homes and things like that. Because the world would be adapted and developed, or at least the human body would be adapted and developed in such a way as to make a lot of those things unnecessary and would save a ton of money. On the other hand, she just suggests that most of the financing for all this cyber research and technology comes from the unbelievably rich members of society, most of whom, she says, couldn't give a flying donut about the healthcare problems of um, ordinary people, day-to-day -day working class people and middle class people. They've got no interest in any of that. So will, even though there is the potential for reducing healthcare issues amongst the vast majority of the populace, will it happen or will the funding and the social structures direct those kinds of social changes into a tiny elite and actually most people won't see any benefit from it. We also have people like Aubrey de Grey, whose view of ageing is that it's a form of illness to be treated and got rid of. And so in the future, as we already mentioned earlier, you could have 80, 90, 100 year old individuals who physically look as if they're about 30 or 20 or whatever age they want to stop the ageing process at. So they won't get grey hair, they won't get wrinkly, they won't get short-sighted and deaf or suffer any of the kinds of problems that come with being 90 years old or 100 years old or 110 years old. They'll go on being healthy for a long time and ageing will become a phenomena of the history books rather than the lived ex human experience. Or at least it will be for those who can afford the treatment. There may well always be people who can't afford it and who will just have to age naturally. Um, there is an argument in postmodernism and posthumanism which rather rejects transhumanism as posthumanists don't like big stories, what they refer to as meta narratives. That, um, they, they say that these are sort of a, a nonsense of modernism and that the world doesn't really have meta narratives, it's just in the imagination of sociologists. The, the idea of moving forward into this golden age of science when illness and disease and death and ageing are all left in the past could be described as a meta-narrative. The, the, the story of what this brave new world will look like. Would it happen or will that just be yet another nonsense story that's spun to part some people with it from their money and get some politicians into power but never really comes about? Who knows? Who knows? Um, this is a few of the bits that have already happened. So this is not just, this isn't the future, this is the present with the speculation of what it will lead to in the future. So there is already an organisation, a company called Cyborg Nest, uh, which is one of several biohackers. Um, biohackers are businesses that set themselves up to research ways of hacking into, in inverted commas, human biology. So how to, like the guy with the, with the um, cranium implant that enables him to see colour, how can you put machinery into the human body, computer machinery, high-tech, artificial intelligence machinery into the human body that will enable it to do things it cannot currently do? So you could hear a wider array of sounds than you currently do or see a wider range of colours on the colour spectrum than you currently are capable of, or detect aromas that you can't currently detect. Uh, do all sorts of things that the body doesn't do at the moment. So there, there's money and investment and research going into that, and obviously the hope of those companies is that one day they'll be able to market their products and get back the money invested in the research and a big fat profit on top, no doubt. So they'll be selling to well, whoever can afford it and wants it. Um, in terms, we've already mentioned transhumanists in, um, involving a lot of very, very wealthy people. Um, a lot of tech billionaires, people who've made an enormous amount of money from high-tech industries, 
like Peter Thiel, Elon Musk, um, Sergey Brin, Mark Zuckerberg, all class themselves as transhumanists. I'll leave that one with you to reflect on. Uh, there's another organization, business organization called Cryonics, um, sorry, sorry, called Alcor, and they have developed a technique called Cryonics, or other, um, which enables the body to be deep frozen. It isn't a brand new thing, but it's an improvement on previously existing techniques of this sort. So someone who is on their deathbed can be deep frozen and their body put into suspended animation with the hope that at some point in the distant future, or maybe even not too distant future, they can be reanimated because there will be a cure for the disease that was killing them off. So they'd be reanimated, given whatever the treatment is, and restored to their health and their life. And the assumption is that once they're um, unfrozen, as it were, their mind will kick back in. Um, this particular uh, facility, Alcor, has 117 patients in it, um, all of whom are rich enough to pay for the $200,000 whole body preservation costs. There are some companies looking into just preserving the head, the brain, rather than the whole body, but that's, that's kind of more like... Um, science fiction stuff at the moment uh, as to how that will go and it may be of course that in a few years time they defrost these bodies ready to provide them new medical treatment and it turns out that their minds have gone entirely and, and maybe even if the illness that was killing them is treated what they've then got is someone in a vegetative state who has no mental capacity whatsoever we have no idea what it's going to be like for people when they're defrosted whether it will really work or not, or whether um, these are just very rich people paying a ton of money to have their corpses put in the fridge, to no great advantage to themselves in the long run. But what's in its early days now, give it 50 years, give it 100 years, the science will improve the technology, or will it now? It's an ameliorist assumption that the science will improve and the technology will improve. Maybe would have gone into a new dark age, who knows, maybe none of this will happen and the world will go off in a totally different direction, but this is the prospect of those with the money to afford it, that they will be resurrected, their disease is cured, and they will go on being able to live longer and longer and longer lives. Which brings us to the end of this um, lecture and this whole module. Um, you'll get your module evaluation forms, if like, you might already have gotten by the time you're listening to this, uh, if you can give some feedback for this module for how it could be improved for students doing it next year. And whilst I won't physically be be with you over the Christmas holidays, obviously, um, if you do need any help or advice or you're mulling over ideas for dissertations, you're worried about essays, what have you, I'll be dipping in and out to my emails over the Christmas break um, so I can answer emails or if you need a video supervision chat thing, to discuss ideas face to face, we can do that. Um, so you're not completely abandoned. <laughs> but obviously I'll be seeing you again for your next modules um, towards the end of January 2021. We're waiting to hear whether we'll still be doing the AB, AB weeks or whether we'll go back to full-time normal teaching at the moment, I don't know. So I'm assuming probably AB, AB, unless we hear otherwise. But I'll see you all for the live chat on Wednesday afternoon, just for an hour. Um, you can discuss your views of the subjects raised here, ask it, raise any questions you've got, etc. Hope you're well, and speak to you soon. Take care. Bye-bye.